Good morning, everybody. Morning. To start out this service, uh, today is Scout Sunday. We're honoring the boy and girl, boy and girl Scouts here that we have this great partnership with here at the church. And at the beginning of the service, now we're going to have a flag ceremony uh, presented by the Scouts. But first of all, before we do that, uh, how many of you in here, or even those who are watching on live stream, put it in the chat space, are Eagle Scouts, or if you're Girl Scouts, are Gold Star Scout? Please stand if you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we, like I say, we, uh, we appreciate the partnership we have with this church and the, and the Scouts in raising men and women into leaders, but uh, most importantly, uh, doing it in the faith of Christ. At this flag ceremony, they'll be doing uh, their loyalties. The first one is a loyalty to the Scouts. Above that is a loyalty to the nation. And then above all of them is a loyalty to God. So please uh, join us now for this, as the Scouts come in. Audience, please rise. Color guard, forward march. Scout salute. Scout salute. Color guard, Holt. Color guard, cross the colors. Post the colors. What do you mean? Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in the Scout Oath. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, as so physically strong, mentally alert, and morally strict. Scout law, a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Two. Now the Girl Scouts are coming to theirs. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, responsible for what I say and do, to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and to be a sister to every Girl Scout. Please retire the colors. Color guard, forward march. Scout salute. Color guard Holt. Color guard dismissed. True Betty's. You may be seated. 
uh, I can't iterate, reiterate enough how much uh, this scouting uh, program uh, helps this church. Many of the things you see around the church we'd have to pay to have done, they are voluntarily opening to do that. They had a lock-in last night, so if they look a little sleepy, especially the adults, <laughs> there that's why. They were here all night. So thank you for the scouts. And uh, typically what would happen, they'd present the colors at the beginning of the service and then re retired at the end, but we had to do it all at once. So uh, it's a little different. And after this service, if you want to go out there, you probably saw it when you're walking in, they're having a pancake breakfast. It's uh, $3 uh, for two, bake, two pancakes, bacon, a choice of coffee, or orange juice. You can't beat that at IHOP, so that's a good deal. And we aren't having uh, the Holy Grounds today because of the pancake breakfast. Um, we're starting today our m new member class, Membership 101. It starts right after at 1230. It's a Zoom uh, meeting. So if you're interested, if you want to join the church, if you want to transfer your membership, uh, we ask you to please go on the website on the on the church app and sign up so you can get the link to the Zoom. If you uh, can't don't have time to do that, then come see me after this church service, and we'll get you signed up. And finally, uh, we got something exciting here. It's this new thing called Yoga Church. Now, don't think you have to do that in order to get be a member of Yoga Church. So uh, it's it's very low movement yoga. And you say, what is yoga church? But something for, for this new generation and something we're trying new. Uh, basically, it's prayer, it's worship, it's scripture, and it's reflection. But you're doing it all while you're doing yoga moves. So it's very Christian-based. So if you're interested in that, sign up on saumc.life. It starts uh, this coming Saturday, uh, the 12th. So um, I didn't introduce myself, did I? I'm Pastor Gary Rideout, one of the co-senior pastors here at the church, along with my wife Jane, and she'll be giving a message. And we're excited now to have this time of worship. Good morning, everyone. Isn't it cool that we can come together and celebrate an organization that teaches young people to serve so they grow up with that mentality? I think that's um, really the best response that we can have to God is you've done all this for us, so we're going to reach out and serve other people. Uh, why don't you stand with me uh, this morning? If I didn't introduce myself, my name is David. Whether you're joining us here in person or online, we are very glad that you are here with us and just want to say that everybody is welcome here, no matter where you've been, no matter what you did on the way here, you know, when that guy cut you off in traffic, uh, we still love you. You're welcome here. So why don't we join, or why don't you join us this morning as we worship? Stand. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Holy is the Lord It's 
come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that we can come before you and that we don't have to be afraid of coming to you because you've already proven that you love us. And that's what the song is about, is our response to your love. And I pray this morning, just as we were, we're talking about the youth that are in here showing how they serve, that our heart would be to serve you because of the love that you've shown us. We would show that to other people. In your name, amen. You may be seated. morning, St. Andrews. My name is Jane Rideout. I am the other co-pastor along with my husband, Gary, and I want to welcome you. Those of you online today, we're really pleased that you're worshiping with us today. And for those of you in the building, what a blessing. And I got to be honest with you, I was not involved in scouts growing up. And so it always kind of takes my breath away to hear, especially the little ones, reciting those vows to live life in a certain way. What an amazing ministry I believe that is. So um, we're so grateful for our relationship with the, the scouts. So in church world, we're all very aware that Lent is one month away. Now, Lent is that season just, it's about the 40 days prior to Easter. And in church world, you're constantly thinking about what are we going to do for Lent? And that's something that's kind of big for us. And we do have something special planned for the church. If you are a part of this congregation and you want to participate in any way, shape, or form, we're going to be reading through the book of Luke through Lent. In fact, you'll be able to sign up so that you will get a daily email with your reading on it of what you're going to read that day. So when you wake up, if you're one of those people that roll over and pick up your phone, your reading will be right there, 6 a.m. every single day. And that's going to help us do it together because it's hard to read scripture. And we think if we do it as a community, it will be easier and it will be a blessing to you. Because when we sit under scripture, God transforms us. So we thought in order to kind of get ready for this big push that we're going to do in one month, that we would start kind of warming up our muscles, our spiritual muscles, by spending the month of February talking and practicing spiritual practices, or as a lot of people know, spiritual disciplines. We're calling it spiritual practices because the word discipline just kind of has a lot of baggage with it, but it's that sort of idea. And what I mean by spiritual practices, I mean things like prayer and fasting, meditation, simplicity, Sabbath, and there's actually a ton more. But we're only going to do four. So during the month of February, each week you are going to be challenged to practice a spiritual discipline that week, okay? And so when you came in today, you should have received one of these little cards, all right? If you are online, there's probably, I'm thinking there's a link to it below in the chat space, but this will also be on the Monday recap, and so you'll be able to see it. But I'm going to do you a little favor. I'm going to actually read it to you right now because I know what human beings are like. I know what I'm like. You look at that and you say, oh, I'll read it later and then next week suddenly here. So I'm going to go read it to you, the challenge for this week, just in case you lose this little piece of paper. 
All right. So for this week, the challenge is to practice meditation in five-minute increments. And we want you to do this three times um, this week. You can increase to 10 minutes or more, but aim for no less than five. Whether you are cooking, commuting to work, brushing your teeth, sitting in your backyard, or waiting in um, car line, turn off your radio, your television, your computer, or unplug from your phone, and sit in stillness for five minutes. And you'll probably need to put a timer on because five minutes will feel really long. It's this way you'll know you'll make the whole five minutes. Focus on your family. How do, you how do they experience your presence? Expand your thinking to the people you work with, your neighbor, the store cashier. Think about your encounters during the day or from the day before. What were your interactions like? How is your tone with those around you? How do you think their encounter was with you? How would you like to encounter the people you see each day? Do you see them with God's loving eyes? Do they experience God's grace through your words and your responses? So we're giving you a way to sit for five minutes, three times this week, and just meditate on these questions, okay? Now that's not hard, right? That's something everybody can do. So that's your challenge this week, and that's going to help get us ready for the big read during Lent. All right, so let's talk a little bit about spiritual practices because... For a lot of people, they don't bother with them. They feel like ancient things that you, that you do just every once in a while. But actually, there's, there's a lot of important truth that we miss. So the first thing that we often get wrong is that we think spiritual practices are meant to fix us, right? Lord knows we all need fixing. We often are not as spiritual enough. We don't read our Bible enough. We don't, we're not always nice. We, there's all these different things. And so I'm going to do a spiritual practice to fix me. But the reality is that is not the point or the why of a spiritual practice. The point of a spiritual practice is our, because spiritual practices are for the well-being of one's neighbor. Now that's not really what we expect, Right? When we think of spiritual practices, we don't think that they're not about us, but they're actually for our neighbor, all right? So I used to have a professor who would say, when you want to change, God is more likely to transform you when you're serving someone else. That the best transformation of our hearts and our minds happens when we're in service. So that's kind of an interesting thing about the gospel, but it turns out when we are caring for others or in service with others or treating others kindly, we're more likely to be transformed or fixed. The second thing is that often we think we have to change everything to practice a spiritual discipline. And if we can't change everything, then we just simply can't do it. But that's not actually accurate because the truth is Spiritual practices simply reform a believer's mental and physical habits. God takes us like we are, and he just tweaks us. He doesn't change us like, it's, it, he just kind of tweaks the way we do things. Maybe it tweaks the way we encounter folks, or it tweaks the way we respond to people. But God doesn't change everything. He changes who we are, but he just changes us slightly. So that we go from maybe a, a sharpness to a kindness. So you don't have to be afraid that everything in your life will be different. The third thing that we often get wrong is that we think spiritual practices are for seasons like Lent only, or they're just temporary. But the reality is spiritual practices are a way of life. And the last one is, and most common, is we don't do spiritual practices because, you know, we are going to fail. We're not going to do it well. And one more thing to prove to me that I'm not a good Christian, that I'm not a, I don't live the life I should live, that I'm broken... And so we don't do anything at all, but when the reality is, is that spiritual practices are developed out of one's existing practices, schedules, and lifestyle. They're not meant to be hard. They're meant to be incorporated into what you're already doing. So as we said this week with meditation, take a moment where you tend to already sit in quiet, maybe the carpool line, but this time turn your phone off or turn your radio off. You have the space in your life to do five minutes of meditation. Just put it in a space where you normally would be maybe plugged in on the phone. That's all it takes. And most of us know right now that we probably need a little less time in TikTok. 
in a little more time meditating. So that is, that's the goal for this week, and hopefully you'll be doing this with your neighbor in mind. So I want to go to our scripture reading today, and I chose this scripture reading because it's about a church that is going to war within itself. They are fighting. They are not meditating on how to love their neighbor. Instead, they are really about to destroy each other. And so the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the Galatian church to help them deal with this issue. Now, we don't really know what they were fighting about. There's, a, there's theories back and forth. There's probably two different things, and it was probably actually both. But what had happened recently is that this church had been formed because of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came into this world, and prior to Jesus being in the world, the Jewish people lived under something called the Law of Moses, which was a bunch of rules and regulations to teach them how to be a holy people. It told you when to eat and when to sleep and what days you couldn't work and what days you could and even what to eat. There was a lot of rules. But when Jesus came, he changed things and he said that he came to fulfill the law and, and things were, were now changing and, and the, the folks were struggling about what, what that actually meant. And there was one thing in, in particular was about circumcision. They were believing that new converts needed to be circumcised, and that's not actually true of the gospel. The gospel said you just simply believe, but they were insisting that they be circumcised because that was the old way of doing things. There also was this other issue that we think was probably at work and that now that they no longer lived under the law, they had what's called freedom, the freedom to self-regulate, and they were probably enjoying their freedom a lot. When you've lived under rules your whole life, it's like going off to college and you get to suddenly make decisions for yourself. It's probably what was happening in the church. Folks were going a little crazy. And as a result, they were fighting and they didn't like each other. And Paul really makes a point, this was bad. This was really ugly. Nobody was thinking about their neighbor. So I'm going to read to us now just a section of this letter that was written to encourage these folks by the Apostle Paul. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses. But serve each other through love. All the law has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, be careful that you don't get eaten up by each other. This was a bad problem. This was a battle within a church. Kind of sounds like families to me. Everybody has opinions and everyone's pretty sure they're right. And it's not going in a good direction. So let's break this down a little bit and see exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying to them because this is a really meaty three verses. In fact, these verses are probably some of the most transformable verses in the um, transformative verses in the Scripture. So you're going to have to listen carefully to kind of really grasp what is being said here. So let's begin with this first thing that Paul says. He says, we are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. What does he mean by that? Well, here, the Apostle Paul is teaching these people that when they became believers of Jesus Christ, when they were baptized and joined with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, some amazing things happened to them. They received his grace, and now they have what you call Christian freedom. And this has to do with our moral ethics. This Christian freedom is how we practice what we believe. It's how we do it, how we practice our ethics. Let's see if I can explain this. I'm sure you've run across a lot of wonderful people in this world who are non-believers, who are amazing human beings. Human beings that go into this world and they serve others, they sacrifice for others, they're kind, they're loving, and they have no faith whatsoever in Jesus Christ. They are out there. And you think, what's the difference between them and us as Christians? Well, one of it is, is this freedom we have. And so I want to see if I can explain this freedom. And this freedom is something you experience. And hopefully you've, you've had this experience before, but it's something to kind of chew on. But because you're a Christian believer, the way you do those acts of service, you experience it differently. Here's the first one. When we love or give or in Christian service, this freedom is not coherced. It is, is not, we do not feel forced or obliged to do good things. 
That, that's not what it is ever about. When we experience Christ's Christian freedom, this, this beautiful freedom that's offered to us, we do it because the Holy Spirit nudges us to, never strong arms us and never forces us to be kind or merciful or serve. We always have the choice, but we are nudged forward in service, and then we have the choice to respond. We don't have to be guilted. This is the Holy Spirit lovingly nudge us forward. And we get to choose what we are going to do. Now, the key is to choose to do what the Holy Spirit is nudging you to do because he wants to bless you. But it's still our choice. Number two, this Christian freedom means that when we do actually do the right thing, when we extend grace, when we serve others, when we're kind to someone who's mean to us, we don't ever have to worry about whether they thank us or appreciate what we've done. You see, because it's the Holy Spirit nudging us forward, we don't have to worry about whether people respond in the right way. Because you're not doing it really for them as much as you're doing it for Him. And that kind of takes out. Because I promise you, if you're going to be really serious about Christian service, you're going to get rejected. You're going to be unappreciated at times. You're going to be kind to someone who's still nasty at you. You're going to do something, take time on your day off and do something for someone else, and they're not going to appreciate what you do. I mean, I just promise you that's the reality of service, but it doesn't matter. Because you're not doing it for them. You're doing it because the Holy Spirit is nudging you to do it. And you have this sense that it's okay. Also, the great thing about Christian freedom, and this is the third, is that when you do good deeds, when you love your neighbor and you respond correctly to your neighbor, you don't have to worry about the outcome. Because you gave it freely because it was given freely to you. Let me see if I can explain that. We all want to be in Christian service, and we want good fruit from it. We want a, a positive outcome. But the thing that's different about Christian freedom is that God brings the outcome. We don't bring it. We're never responsible for the outcome. We're responsible for obediently being in service. But God is in charge of the outcome. It just changes the way you serve. You're not doing it because you want applause. You're not doing it because you think you are going to change the world. You're doing it because God's nudged you forward. And you're just obediently doing what he's asked you to do, understanding that instead of, like, thinking you're all such a wonderful per person, you don't, get bumped, you don't get pumped up by Christian service. You instead feel just deep gratitude. Because you can't believe that God let you be a part of his process. You don't get a big head from Christian service. Instead, you have just gratitude. Because, gosh, God thought I was worthy to be used. That's an amazing thing. It just transforms the way we serve. Now, if these things are all true, what's wrong with this Galatian church? Why are they fighting? Well, it kind of goes back to that issue where we talked about freedom. Freedom's a dangerous thing. It's hard to, to control ourselves when we're given freedom. But that's exactly what God has done for us. When Jesus came, he did not throw out the law of Moses. But instead, he did the opposite. He fulfilled it. And he fulfilled it in this way. Let's go back to our scripture. All the law has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. So basically what happened, instead of living under all the law that told you how to sit and how to walk and how to breathe and everything, he said, all right, now you get to self-regulate. Now you're in charge of your faith. But all you have to do, your one standard is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so that means in every instance in our life and whatever we do, we just have to ask ourselves this one question. This is one thing we have to ask ourselves. What is the most loving response to this particular person in this particular situation? That's a lot of freedom. 
It makes me think of Gary and I in our house and our problem with cookies. We love cookies. And when I make homemade cookies, I put them on a plate and they sit on the cupboard. And every time we walk through the room, we grab another cookie, right? That's normal, right? Now, the reality is eventually at some point, if there's any cookies left, I hide them. Because neither of us are strong enough to not walk by and see a cookie and pick it up and eat it. Christian freedom is the same way. This gift that has been given to us can also be our cursing. Because now we're supposed to regulate ourselves and we're supposed to say to ourselves, did I just do the right, most loving thing for this person, this particular person in this particular time? How did I respond? How, how, how did I respond to them? That is a lot harder. That's why we're going to do meditation this week and we're going to focus on that. I mean, how many of you do not react well to people? Don't raise your hand. And walk away feeling guilty or sort of ashamed of yourself or wish you could do better. How many of you wish you could sc quit screaming at your kids or coming back in a sarcastic response to a spouse? Or just stop being curt with the barista who got your order wrong? I mean, most of us walk away and think, oh, I really blew it again. And so instead we just walk around with this guilt that we're a bad Christian. But in reality, what meditation is going to help us do is practice responding in the right way. Because this is what happens. When you actually pause to think about how you've been responding, you start really thinking about it and it doesn't leave you. And I know I've said this in here before, but eventually what happens is you don't get to walk away having mistreated somebody without having to turn around and go back and apologize. I cannot tell you. How many times I have to go back into a store to apologize to somebody? I have to go back into a Starbucks and apologize. I have to go back in. And it doesn't mean I'm cursing anybody out, but I'll just be curt with somebody. And I walk away and I think, that was nothing to do with them. Like, what a big baby I am. Because you made me wait. Or because you were out of the drink I wanted. And so I get all like, hmm. That's not Christ-like. That's not loving my neighbor in a particular person, a particular space. And so then i got to wrap around and go back in and say, I'm sorry. That was my issue, sorry. Well, you know, you get sick of doing that too. <laughs> so it's really nice to start meditating on that so we can start having the right responses. You know, that is when God will transform us when we start treating people the way God wants us to treat them. Now, I'm pushing particular people in particular situations really hard because you cannot have standardized responses to everybody. Let's say somebody has asked me for money. Let's say three different people have asked me for money. I have to determine in each case, is it the most loving thing to give this person money? And I may think about, is it a legitimate need? Is it a good cause? Is it an organization I trust? But sometimes, I don't have a clue. But you don't have to worry about that, because remember what we said about the outcome? God is in the business of the outcome. So even if you give the money to the wrong person, don't worry about it, because God will take care of that. We don't have to fret about it. That's God's job. The outcome is God's job. But we are all called to pause and consider what is the most loving response. And loving doesn't always mean yes. Sometimes loving means no. But we're really to take it to God. Because so often we're not even pausing to think about that. We're just going with our gut or our emotions. But here's the deal. God's so excited to transform us. This spiritual practice this week is going to be a blessing. You know what's going to be the biggest thing about it? You're just going to have sort of this aha moment. Like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Or, oh, that was a good response. That's all. That'll be the, if you later on think you need to make amends, we'll make amends. But this is just a process that opens our heart to the whisper of the Holy Spirit. And you can tr trust the process. Because God wants the very best for us. And God really wants us to love our neighbor. Will you pray with me? 
Loving God, we thank you today that we'll get to celebrate this communion that reminds us that we're all equally loved by you, that you delight in us, that you look at us and you think, oh, man, my child. And you give us this opportunity to confess our brokenness, to confess our need for you. We thank you, Father God, that we're about to receive your grace and be transformed once again. Even if we don't even understand it, even if it doesn't quite make sense to us, we do this out of obedience. And you said, this is the way I will change your life. We thank you, loving God, that you give us the opportunity to bless the world around us. That this is not a small faith, that this is a large faith that is about everybody. And we thank you, Father God, that you give us the Holy Spirit to receive any ways where we need to up our game or simply just know it's all because of you. We thank you and we praise you. And now we pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I know as, as Jane was speaking, I was thinking about all of the different things you hear about meditation today because that's a big thing that people are writing about because we have our phones constantly in front of us or we have, you know, these schedules that are going from place to place to place to place and then we fill those in-between times with our phone again. And just the idea of slowing down to really reflect on what's important is seems to be a hot topic. And... Uh, one of the things that I hear, though, that I always think, well, that doesn't make any sense, is a lot of people will tell you to meditate and listen to yourself. And my initial reaction to that was, I'm kind of the reason why <laughs> I'm in the state I'm in, so what good is meditating and listening to myself going to do to help me get out of it? Because I kind of got myself here in the first place, you know? And so... One thing that's been really helpful for me is to view, because all kinds of things will come to your mind as you're meditating, um, but is to first like keep our vision, keep our focus on God where it should be anyway. But then as other things come to mind, think, okay, how does this look in the framework of, of what God's told me? How did I interact with that person? How should I interact with the next person? And so for me, maybe it's because I, I, I like doing art and music and all of that, but one of the helpful ways for me to meditate has been to picture the rest of, you know, whatever point of the day you're in is this blank canvas, and what am I going to fill that with? You know, and you look back sometimes, and you think, well, I have this, I have this blank canvas that's just like a bunch of scribble marks, and looks like I let my three-year-old, I, I don't have a three-year-old, just so you know, I'm not hiding a three-year-old somewhere, Casey, but, um, but it, like scribble all over the place, and you think, well, well, that was a mess, so what am I going to make the next part look like? Am I going to let it be a mess in the way that I'm responding to people and loving people? Or am I going to make something beautiful out of what I have left in this day? And I think that's, for me at least, a helpful way to, uh, like the thought process as I'm, as I'm meditating is to have some kind of focus. What am I going to fill this with? What am I going to fill this day with? And how does God want me to do that? Um, so we're, we are observing communion this morning, and one of the things that scripture says is to meditate as you're doing that, to reflect on, am I taking this in a worthy manner? And just so you know, um, what that means is, how am I treating my neighbor? If you dig into what they're talking about when they say, am I taking communion in the right way? It's, am I treating my neighbor in the way that they deserve to be treated, in the way that God asks, maybe not deserve, but <laughs> in the way that God asks me to treat them. So what I'd like to do um, as I start playing this beginning part, if we could all close our eyes, bow our heads, and just think about the words that we've heard this morning and reflect on that. Am I treating people in the way that you've asked me to, God? And then we'll sing this next song together.
and maybe things came to your mind just just now even. You know, that's, that's a really short time compared to the five minutes we're going to be doing. So think about, like, all of the internal work that God can do on you. And if so, then just know that the prayer rails are open. We're moving into our time of offering, which is our response to God. So if, if your response to what you just heard is to come up here and pray, then feel free to do that as we're singing the next song. But also, if you would uh, like to give to the ministry here, uh, you can give online at saumc.life through the Church Center app, or we have baskets in the front and in the back. Do we have baskets in the back? Yes, we have baskets in the back. I just can't see them. So uh, feel free to get up, move around, make your way there. And if you would like to pray during this time, uh, feel free to do that as well. You are my vision, O King of my heart. Nothing else satisfies only you, Lord. You are my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, your presence, my life. You are my wisdom, you are my true word. I ever with you and you with me, Lord. You're my great father and I'm your true son. You dwell inside me, together we're one. Oh, man's empty praise. You're my inheritance now and always. You and you only the first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure you are. When victory's won, may I reach heaven's joy, O oh bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, O oh ruler of all. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. And let's pray. Father, I pray that just like we sang in this song, that you really would be that thing which we are focused on, that it wouldn't be ourselves but it would be on you, and we know that that results in us loving other people. So I pray that this morning that we would realize that our identity is you, in you, our worth is in you, and that we would uh, be thankful for the sacrifice that you made for us that we're about to receive. In your name, amen. So the communion table of the United Methodist Church is an open table. That means all are invited. If you are home, we really encourage you to grab something, a cracker or a piece of bread, any kind of juice or coffee or whatever is some kind of a liquid. Because we believe that the practice of this sacrament really helps us in our day-to-day -day walk. It's a mystery. It's a grace that is freely offered to us. And we really believe that is vital for all of us. And so even if you're at home and it may feel a little strange to be doing this, I, I encourage you to grab something so you can participate in communion with us. Now, if you're in the building, you should have gotten one of these. Is there anyone who needs a little cup? And everyone should have one. Just raise your hand. we got tons. Anybody's? Oh, but right down here. Right here. Anywhere else? Okay, just keep your hand up. Yeah, there you go. Super. Don't worry about opening it yet. I'll t give you instructions on when and how to do this. Um, and it, it won't be hard to do, I promise you. But um, let's, 
first go ahead and bless this gift to us. You know, as I said, it's an open table, which means anybody can come. Anyone who comes will encounter the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But I also can never take communion without remembering and celebrating this reminder of how God views us. When we take communion, God doesn't see us as the world sees us. God doesn't care if we are rich or poor, tall or short, anything, male or female. He doesn't see us other than as a blessed child. And that's such an important thing because we all are loved by God, but more importantly, in many ways, we are all in need of this grace. There are none around us who do not need this grace. We all are broken, and this is God's gift to us. So I'm going to bless the bread, and then we will do the um, breaking of the bread. But let's join me in prayer again. Loving God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon this gift of bread and juice. May it be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that we might be joined with you both in your death and in your resurrection, that we might know life eternal, and that we might experience your grace throughout our days. We thank you for this amazing gift that we do not deserve, but that is offered to us freely. In Jesus' precious name, amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was gathered together with his friends, and they were eating a meal. And he took the bread and he lifted it up, which would have been the normal tradition, and he gave thanks to the Father, and then he broke it. And what he said didn't sound like the normal thing. He said, this is my body, broken for you. And then at the end of the supper, he took a glass of wine, and again, he lifted it up, and he gave thanks to the Father. And then he said something that was even more confusing. This is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. He was teaching them about something that would happen, that would change the world, change all of history, and give us all this opportunity to know Jesus in a way that they hadn't known him before, to be joined with him in eternal life. And so this amazing gift doesn't always have to be understood to still receive it and to still benefit from it. We simply do so by faith, accept it. And so today, the way we're going to do that is with these strange little cups. And so I ask right now that you try to pull off the very first layer. It's actually translucent, so you can get to the wafer. So it should be totally clear. And the wafer here, then it doesn't look like something you actually eat, but we will. And here's the weird part about this. This is the most important meal you're going to eat today. Even if you're going out for a really good brunch, it doesn't come close. This is the best meal because it is in this meal that we are transformed by the grace of Jesus. So once you get it open, lift it up so we can see if everybody's ready. And then in a moment, once everybody gets that off, all right. Now let's partake together. Hmm. I guess that's nasty, but it doesn't matter. You keep thinking it's going to taste better every month. It doesn't. That's okay. What we're looking for is far deeper and spiritual. Now pull back the foil for the cup and lift it up when you have it pulled back. I always feel like the lifting up is the witness to I believe in this strange mystery that Jesus has called us to. Now receive the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that is good. That helps. Thank you for participating in this thing that Jesus calls us to so that we might be the Christians he calls us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand and join with us as we sing this last song.
Sing this out. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Thank you again for joining us this morning, whether it was here or online. Uh, just know that we are all worshiping together in spirit and celebrating together uh, the blood of Christ. So just remember as you're leaving that we are, our assignment this week is to meditate, right? It's going to be, I promise you, the most difficult five minutes of your life if you've never done it before. But it'll be worth it. All right, let's pray real quick. Father, we love you. We thank you so much that we can come together and worship you. In your name, amen. Have a good week, everyone.